it's pumpkin season. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, so <laughs> it's just the season where everyone is eating or purchasing or carving pumpkins. Um, so I thought it would be fun to do a little history highlights of the pumpkin. Uh, pumpkins originated in the Americas. The indigenous peoples of America and North Central and South America had a huge variety of land types that they um, cultivated and were doing so for centuries. Pumpkins didn't come on the European scene until the mid 1500s, once they were taken from the Americas and transported back to Europe. Um, in Europe and Asia before the 1500s, they did have different types of cucurbits um, or things within the cucumber family, which is where pumpkins and squashes and cucumbers and melons all reside. One of the main ones that they had is this guy, the bottle gourd. <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, so bottle gourds are, wow, they go way back in the archaeobotanical uh, references um, and findings. And they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. This one happens to be an Italian seed source and it's light green, long and cylindrical. This is probably a little bit too old for fresh eating. Um, when they're smaller, they're better and you can chop them up and fry them or put them in stews and things like that. Another shape that you'll see with bottle gourds are things like this, right? <laughs> which is much more bottle shaped. You can tell where it gets the bottle shaped gourd and sometimes they have like two bulbs on them. Um, this one might be really good for making into a ladle later on if I dry it out. So pretty fun. Uh, they also had in Europe a wide range of uh, other cucurbits like um, cucumbers and then melons like watermelons and honeydews and musk melons. A lot of their melons were shorter, darker, ribbier kind of structures that were really fragrant, not kind of like the washed up things we find in the grocery store these days. So anyway, getting back to pumpkins. Uh, botanically, we can break out pumpkins and squashes into kind of like three main groups. We have the peoples, which are over here, uh, the moshadas, and then the maximums or maxima. <laughs> so uh, with a lot of botanical nomenclature, there's a lot of shifting that went around. And so the names shift over time. But since the 1800s, things have been fairly stable. Um, there is not really a good way or a strong botanical distinction between pumpkins and squashes. Officially, these are all peepo fruits. P-E-P-O is the botanical name for these types of fruits. Um, but we call them pumpkins and squashes. And really, there's no difference. It's just two different nouns for the same thing. Um, pumpkins tend to be more pumpkin shape. <laughs> so round spherical things like this are kind of that shorter, squatter, more classical Cinderella-esque kind of pumpkin. Um, but really, it's just two nouns for the same thing. <laughs> there are a few other cucurbit um, species group. Like one of my favorites is uh, where the silver edge squash resides, which is cucurbit agrosperma. Um, agrosperma is, you know, edible seeds. And that's exactly what happens is that they're grown and uh, eaten or they're grown and then their seeds are harvested and they're these big, beautiful seeds with silver edges, silver edge squash, um, kind of the people's types of the eating of the seeds. So they're really tasty. But anyway, um, in an attempt to keep this short and sweet, I'm going to try to just stick to these three groups. So let's get started with people. So the first group is cucuber people. Uh, the people types originated in Central and North America. They have a wide variety, uh, including both winter and summer squashes. So a uh, quick clarification of the difference between winter and summer squash is there's really not one. <laughs> it's just that um, summer squashes are varietals that have been uh, evolved or designed to be eaten during the summer at an immature stage, um, whereas our winter uh, squashes or pumpkins are designed to have a really long growing season and be eaten mature. So types of summer squash include our zucchinis <laughs> that we maybe all are a little bit tired of eating by now. Uh, we have both uh, crook necks, both the straight and uh, the crooked neck <laughs> crook necks, and then um, other types like the patty pans or the scalloped uh, white and green and yellow zucchinis, which are kind of like these short squished 
UFO looking kind of things. Um, so they're, as again, they're designed to be harvested and eaten immature. You can leave them on the vine a little bit longer. And that's what happened with this one. So it's starting to get a hard shell on it. Um, so this one is probably past its prime and is um, designed, and it's gonna go out and feed the chickens and <laughs> it's not really, I'm not gonna eat it. So there's that. But so for the winter squashes that are in the pipo grove, right? These are ones that we grow to maturity and they take a lot longer, sometimes like several months to fully develop. So it is in your garden, a space and a time commitment to grow these. Uh, they tend to have harder rinds, which allows them to store well. And so therefore then they can be eaten in late fall when they're finally ripe or they're stored throughout the winter. So examples of winter squashes within the people group include our acorn squash, this beautiful thing. Um, and so this is a really fun nutty texture, uh, bakes super well, it's beautiful. Um, something that looks really similar but slightly different is our the carnival squashes. Um, they tend to have a bit more flushing on the outside of different colors and slightly different um, meat inside of it. Um, we also have our delicatas. These are squashes that have really taken off in popularity in the last few years. Um, you can tell by their shape, right? They're really good at being transported across um, using modern day practices. And they're super tasty and kind of single servers. So that's nice. And we also have the spaghetti squash. This is a nice tiny spaghetti squash. I get them smaller just because it's only me that's eating them. But you roast them and then you fluff up the guts with a fork and um, they turn into like this spaghetti noodle looking things and you can then use them as a spaghetti substitute. So this is really fun. But the star of the show of the cucumber people, especially this time of year, right, <laughs> is this guy here. This is our field pumpkins that we like to carve into jack-o'-lanterns, which this is the fate of this one here pretty soon <laughs> um, this week. So field pump pumpkins have been bred pretty much for jack-o'-lanterns and sometimes um, animal feed. Uh, so if you are looking for a pumpkin to make pumpkin pie out of, make sure that you find types that are specifically stated as a uh, sweet, pie pumpkin. So make sure you get the pie pumpkins for your pumpkin pie and not the field pumpkins that you would use for your jack-o'-lantern. The jack-o'-lanterns tend to be watery and mushy and without a whole lot of taste. The, pump, the, uh, the pumpkin pie pumpkins tend to have a little bit more flavor and a higher sugar content. So be careful of that. Which brings us to the next group, which is cucubra moshata. And um, Fun fact is most of the stuff that we buy in cans as pumpkin puree are actually cucumber machadas, not peoples. Let's take a look at those guys. So as I said, many of the super tasty baking pumpkins are in the cucumber machada group. Um, they originated in Central and South America and they tend to have really thick, tender flesh and sweet flesh, making them perfect for baking and pumpkin pies and soups and all sorts of things like that. And again, they are the big, um, pumpkins used for pumpkin pie production <laughs> for canned pumpkin or pumpkin mixes. Um, oftentimes those companies will have their own named varietal that they'll contract to, to be grown. Um, so they have a consistent taste and texture over time. Um, there are some pumpkin-esque moshata types that are available to us as consumers. Although I searched through several stores and I couldn't find any this year. So I'm sorry, I don't have nice examples of those. Um, but they are things called the Long Island Cheese Pumpkins, and then also a whole group that are kind of colloquial known as fairy tale pumpkins, um, or kind of more formally the Moscata de Provence or some of the other um, older French heirloom types. And so the Long Island Cheese Pumpkin is kind of this buff colored and it looks like a wheel of cheese. <laughs> it's short and squat and has big old ribs. And the same thing happens with the Moscata de Provence or the fairy tale pumpkins. They look really much like that Cinderella pumpkin, kind of shorter and with these really big ribs, just full of happy, tasty meatiness. So I wish I could have found some to show you because they're just delightful and beautiful. Um, but this group, the Moshada, also has one of my favorite squash, which is the butternut squash. So traditionally, butternut kind of has the shape of this big round bulbous area. And this is where the seeds are. And then you have this nice 
chunk of solid flesh and it makes it really easy for production because then you can just you know uh, remove the skin and then chop it up and be done with it it's not like some of these other ones where you're really like picking cleavers to break into <laughs> so this is a more traditional shape of the butternut um, squash but the varietals that they're growing these days tend to be um, more uniform in shape and size and so they're kind of veering away from this very distinct form of bulbous baseness to kind of more of this block-ish, brick-ish kind of form. And you can see why this would be so much easier for transportation. Um, it stacks better, it moves better, um, easier for mechanized harvesting and processing. So, but they're still thankfully very tasty. Yay, butternut squash. Oh. Oh. So that brings us to our third group, which is the cucurbita maxima. So the origin of this is the west coast of South America, and were primarily cultivated by the Incas. The maxima varieties are known for its retained stamen and its exposed pericarp. So <laughs> what is a pericarp and what does it look like when it's exposed? So the pericarp is the botanical term given to the flesh that we eat. Um, Normally, what would happen is like, here is our pumpkin or our squash growing, and it has kind of this nice, smooth, uniformed shape. And what it's going to fully enclose all of the flesh, like with um, the acorn or the carnival squash is a really good example of how it's just like this nice, smooth, globus, fully incorporated, just a little spot where it ended up coming together here at the end. With the maxima types, Quite often, <laughs> there's a chunk of flesh that doesn't get fully enclosed and it just kind of sits and hangs out here. Um, this is kind of the most extreme and well-known version. This is a turban squash. Um, also with these, they have quirky stamens or flower parts that kind of tend to hang out. And so you can kind of see that here, this brown quirky uniqueness. And then what happens with that is it kind of starts to make it hard to distinguish between the stem that's connected to the plant and the leftover flower part. So some quirky, quirky, <laughs> unique characteristics. Also, when you're dealing with exposed pericarps, there tends to be this scar that goes around here. And that's a usual, that's a really good botanical indicator of if you're dealing with a maxima or not. So in addition to the turban squash, we have some other ones. Ooh, I'll start with this one. This is a sweet meat. Um, so a nice buff tan color. It has all these fun, quirky, warty ridges. On the bottom here, you can see this is um, one where that exposed pericarp is not quite as exposed. It's a more modern varietal. We're finding with selections that, you know, trying to transport something that has this big mass of flesh hanging out, it's, you know, it's proposed, it's, propo it's, um, it's banged up really easily. So if we, if they develop things that don't have quite that extreme exposed pericarp, it tends to ship better. So we'll see that with this. But nice quirky uh, stem and that quirky base here. So uh, sweet meat, very tasty, stores beautifully. Another similar type ugh, is this guy here. <laughs> so this is a banana squash. Um, I guess because it looks like a banana, people say that it can start to smell and taste a bit like a banana, especially when it starts to get super ripe. Um, the exposed pericarp really doesn't happen, but we do have a bit of a retained stamen hanging out here. Super quirky um, in cap. Oftentimes these are used um, as a centerpiece for a Thanksgiving meal when uh, a turkey isn't wanting to be served. So you can toast and roast this up and it makes a beautiful centerpiece instead. Super tasty. And it feeds a lot of people. <laughs> also stores great. When we're looking at superstars storage of the Maximas, uh, Hubbards are a fantastic example of that. This is one that can at least be um, dated back to the 1800s, maybe even earlier. Um, so the Hubbards tend to have a really thick um, skin, great for storage. And again, we can see a little bit of those retained statements making it hard to tell which is the top, which is the bottom. Uh -huh. um, and then another one is the, um, Kabocha, which is a Japanese squash, but it's really super tasty and fun. It's in the Maxima family again. Quirky ridges, little, not so much exposed pericarp, but definitely retained stamens and that scar there. 
And so this is a squash from Japan, but like all squashes and pumpkins, right? It originated in the Americas. So it was the Portuguese that took this from Central or South America, my apologies, and then transported it to Japan. And then Japan had, you know, embraced it and developed this from it. And then uh, one other fun type that um, exists within the Maximas are um, sometimes called pumpkins, but these are going to be your Queensland and your Yarradales. So this is a Queensland. It has this beautiful dusty blue color to it. Um, this has a really good example of that medium enclosed pericarp. So we have this little bit of flesh that's sticking out and then that scar that runs around. So the Queensland is really popular in Australia. Super tasty too. So all in all, does any of this classification matter? <laughs> for the most part, no, not really. Um, <laughs> for eating and cooking, uh, it's really just about what you prefer. There's such a wide variety across all three of these groups, the peepos, the moshados, the maximums, that it really ends up decide, you know, it's what you like to eat. Um, out of all of this. The Maximas tend to be kind of favored in the grocery stores quite often because they do produce a lot of meat, they store really well, and then um, kind of the more other ones that we see a lot of are the delicatas and the acorns just because I think, I don't know, maybe they're smaller, people know what to do with them more, so, but really it's whatever you prefer. Um, with that, for storage, does any of the classifications matter? Not so much, you're looking for a nice thick rind when it, for uh, storage qualities of pumpkins. And also either, uh, and with that thick rind, what it does is it helps protect bacteria from getting in and out. And then also it um, keeps the moisture within. So the meat doesn't tend to get dried because they will breathe and lose moisture over the course of the winter. So your peepos with the thinner skin do not store quite as well, right? So we can keep these around probably for a month or two where something that has a much thicker skin can stick around for several months, sometimes even four. And like all of a sudden you're in February and you look over at your shelves and you're like, oh gosh, I still have a bunch of squash to eat. That's awesome. Um, so for growing, yes, um, these categories do come into play when you're starting to grow things. So if you are saving your seeds for next year, um, Pumpkins and squashes love to intercross if they're in within the same group. So you can grow usually one type of each of these and you can save the seeds and be fairly assured that your seeds will grow true the following year. So you can grow like one peepo, one butternut, and one hubbard and most likely those seeds won't cross and they'll breed true for you. There's also different growing traits. Some like a resist uh, humidity a little bit better than others, um, and some can take drier conditions. So for historical cooking, maybe the different categories matter, um, like, but mostly it's, it would be just to identify them in paintings and descriptions easier. Um, between the moshadas and the peepos, there's not a whole lot of um, characteristics that the um, still life painters of the pre-1600s tend to capture very well so that you can definitively say one way or another. Um, maximas with the exposed pericarp, um, I mean, that's a characteristic that if it is included in a painting is fairly well identified. Although there is also debate with that, like there's some frescoes um, in Italy from the 1510s that were always thought to have examples of the um, maxima squashes, but now it's um, being reevaluated and they're thinking that it's actually an odor overdeveloped um, uh, melon instead of a squash. So kind of pushing the date of Maxima entering the Italian cuisine into the mid 1500s. So anyway, um, so with that, what would a pre-16 pumpkin taste like? Yeah, I, I have no clue. Uh, we can look at the pictures and the descriptions and kind of you know extrapolate from there but there's just so much variety and there's so much variety from what is what it looks outside to what it is inside, that even if we get something that looks exactly like a painting or an image of the pre-1600s, I, I wouldn't feel very certain saying that the meat of that was representative. Uh, we can look to some of our French heirlooms, like um, 
This one here is a French heirloom that you can date back, I think, to the 1700s. It's the Pont Moran. And then there's other squashes that are well known that were grown in like Colonial Williamsburg and some other areas. Um, but to get it pre 1600s, I recommend looking for those heirloom types that are connected with the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Right? So that was where they originated. And it's kind of like a snapshot of what seeds were taken by the Europeans and brought um, over to Europe and were grown there um, without the varietal selection that has occurred since then. So um, some of those cultivars that are still in existence are things like the Boston Marrow, the Lakota Winter Squash. Um, there's a beautiful wider range of um, Hopi squashes in different colors. And um, one of the summer squashes that we typically see is the patty pan or that um, scallop squash, which is the short little one that looks kind of like a UFO. So, um, a lot of those um, uh, pumpkins and squashes of the indigenous peoples are available through commercial seed suppliers. If you do purchase them uh, through those stores, I would encourage you in turn to find a native um, people's seed collective and donate to their efforts as a way of kind of giving thanks for these amazing gifts of food and plants and nutrition. So one example of that is the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network by the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, there are also groups such as the Native Seed Search, uh, where you can purchase seed directly from an organization that is supporting food sovereignty of tribal communities. Something to keep in mind and keep a lookout for. So with all of that, I hope you have a fantastic, happy pumpkin season, whether it is being admiring the gorgeousness that is a pumpkin, uh, carving it or eating it. So um, I hope everyone is well and I hope you stay safe.